Welcome to Cyber Talk. My name is Ellie Canal. I'm joined today by Matt Butkovic. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the current events going on within cybersecurity. Uh, as today happens to be directly squarely in the middle of the flu season, and you can probably hear me talking about that, uh, why don't we get started a little bit talking about some of the cyber hygiene practices that we're seeing coming out, especially with some of the attacks that were happening in 2018. Sure. So let's talk about the concept of hygiene. So hygiene, physical hygiene in the medical profession specifically, right? So everyone can generally agree that washing your hands will help prevent infection. But at one time, this was a controversial topic as well. In fact, uh, there was a Hungarian doctor named Ignace Semmelweis, who in the 19th century promoted the idea that washing hands would reduce infections in his patients. And was widely, he was widely decried by his fellow doctors. And it took nearly 80 years for his ideas to be adopted. But as we know, right, it's a basic tenet of, of the medical profession now. You must wash your hands and not uh, allow uh, contamination between, between patients. Cyber hygiene is a much newer concept. The idea is what is the, the minimum set of things we can do to reduce the chances that we have some, some bad event, right? So malware or uh, some other exploitation. I would argue, just like it took quite some time for the medical profession uh, to adopt cyber, uh, to adopt physical hygiene, it's taking time for organizations to be comfortable with the idea of, of cyber hygiene. So you'll also find that although for now hundreds of years we've known washing your hands helps uh, reduce the chance of infection, many doctors still fail to do that. A shocking percentage, right, when they do. I, I saw an Australian uh, survey from 2016 that 36% of doctors in, in this given hospital did not uh, adequately wash their hands between patients, right? So why do I tell you all this? Uh, I think we have to adopt the mindset that when we establish the basics and we focus on the basics, it takes diligence to reinforce the importance of those basics, right? So I'm really sorry to see you're, you're suffering from a cold. Um, and what I'm uh, to kind of tie the conversation together, Ali, I think we could give folks today an understanding of things they can do at a basic level that helps prevent some of the atrocious things we saw in 2018 in cyber. Sure. And I know that some of the stuff that I've heard about, at least, is good practices. You know, you have choose strong passwords. A lot of people are now pushing use password managers. We have a lot of concepts that you want to use two-factor authentication. Uh, are there certain ones that you'd want to, you know, portray that, hey, these are the things we've really seen being problematic in terms of causing attacks or causing other kinds of data loss? Yeah, there's many lists out there. So I point to the, the Center for Internet Securities list, right, their cyber hygiene list. Um, the service resilience management model, we have a, a cyber hygiene list. It's in the essentials. Uh, the Australian Signals Directorate uh, has also done a really good job of creating that list. Um, you mentioned passwords or credentials, right? So I'm thinking about uh, notable events in 2018. Uh, if I think about, uh, for instance, the Under Armour breach that we saw, right? We now know that uh, passwords were stored both in a very strongly encrypted way using bcrypt and then a less strongly encrypted way using SHA-1. To me, that's an example of taking your eye off the fundamentals, right? Which is, why don't you have a comparable level of encryption for all passwords, right? Also prompting the conversation, do we need to go beyond simple passwords for credentialing, or do we need to adopt a two-factor approach, for instance? Sure. And I'm, one of the things, that, as you're talking about that, you know, there's a lot of, as a user, you know, let's say I'm just some guy trying to use my, my company network, or I'm someone trying to use an online service, or even just something temporarily to share something with a friend. I don't have control over the kind of infrastructure that they're going to provide for me. So is there anything that I would want to do to make sure that, you know, whatever, however I'm using this service, it doesn't really hurt me in the long run? Yeah, I think there's a concept of fit for purpose, which is um, the first thing a person and, and more of an organization should do is determine the requirements to protect that information, right? So um, if, as, and this fits directly into cyber hygiene. Um, step one, know what you have, right? Understand the nature of the assets you operate. How are those assets used in the organization? Uh, once you've made that list of, of the essential things that you do and the, the assets that support them, then really think through the protection requirements. And this is going to vary. So, uh, Ellie, if it's a recipe you put in the cloud, it's different than um, information-related national security, for instance, right? But in both cases, you can articulate a specific uh, risk scenario and a specific set of requirements to protect that information. And, and come, going back to the doctor example, you know, it's really critical that a surgeon, prior to doing surgery, washes his hands and uses all the soap and uses everything he needs to. The techniques will vary based on the criticality and the nature of the threat, right? So in the case of infection, you're describing sort of in the medical profession and also the, the, the diligence you apply uh, is dependent on the context. And the same thing applies in cybersecurity, right? Uh, there is no sort of one-size-fits-all. Um, with that said, uh, I think we've been striving for for a long time 
and cyber hygiene as an articulation of is what is that minimum baseline? What, what are those set of practices we can expect everyone to do? So if you're using the Amazon cloud uh, or you're trusting your credit card with a very small vendor, are they employing the same concepts to protect your information? Right. To kind of move off of passwords for a second and talking about the protections there. So there's been a lot of ways that data has been attacked in the past. We talked a little bit about passwords. I know one of the ones that comes through is phishing. Uh, and when you're doing a phishing attack or when someone's trying to execute a phishing attack, they're not so much relying on an insecure password or even insecure data. They're trying to bypass all those protections and access the data in a second way. Is this something, how, how would you say people should be protecting themselves against that? Yeah, so phishing uh, remains one of the most effective techniques that attackers use because it plays on human frailty, right? Um, no matter how much you train your workforce, Unfortunately, a certain percentage, it might be small, will still probably fall for that payload, right? They'll click on that malicious, that malicious attachment. It's sort of a strange one when I think about it. When I think about um, the usability of computing, it's one of those issues where we tell the user something really dangerous can happen, and we give them very few really sound technical safeguards, right? We basically say, be smart of things and don't click on stuff that looks dangerous, right? Right. So uh, step one, don't click on things that look dangerous, right? But beyond that, um, I, I would advise that organizations and even your, and people in their individual lives should think hard uh, about the way they consume email, right? Um, the, if it's not from a trusted source, if it's not valid, in some way you readily recognize, don't click on it, right? So let's talk about phishing. Um, phishing just doesn't affect the, the theft of credentials for individuals. It doesn't just affect the exfiltration of credit card data. It's also, uh, there's good evidence it's affecting critical infrastructure, right? Uh, there are examples now where uh, control systems um, have been compromised or it's believed they've been compromised as a result of a phishing threat vector. That's interesting. And as these things get compromised and as people are, are getting access to it, it just makes it that, you know, however strong all the protections you may have in place those are all bypassed. And there's really, you know, all the work you put into it, just because this person was able to get the phishing through, it, all that was for not almost. Right. So, so think about it this way, right? We're talking about uh, what the essential minimum practices are, right? You've constructed these elaborate defenses, right? You've spent a zillion dollars on stuff that hangs off the network, right? You've gone to RSA and you bought all the boxes of blinky lights that are going to make you safe. And then someone gives away the, the key to the door lock that allows right. them to steal your data with, with phishing. So it's really a vexing problem because it feels like we should have a, a better technical safeguard, and we really don't. Now, there are smart things you can do and certainly products that help, but I think this will remain, at least in the near term, uh, a real worry for all types of organizations. Right. So one thing which I think a lot of people tend to have issues with is the fact that, you know, no matter, I like the term you use there, boxes of blinky lights, because it really kind of fits it. You know, you have this big room filled with boxes of blinky lights, but those don't really work. It's, it, they're only as strong as your weakest link, which tends to be the person using all the software and hardware. So to that extent, is there, are there best practices for how you educate the people? Hey, you know, be careful of things about like phishing. Be careful of plugging in USB drives. Be careful sure. of all the small stuff that, that tends to break these networks down. Yeah, I, I think training the end user, right? So educating the end user in cybersecurity has a place. Um, but I think, and this is a somewhat controversial opinion potentially, which is, we should look to other disciplines, right? We, we should expect that the user uh, of a computer will look and feel and operate like the user of an automobile or a toaster, right? There's things that are rational to say don't do and things that are implicit you shouldn't do and things we know that are just the abuse case, right? So I think that, that's, that's one thing I'd add there. Talking about, and I, I think we've coined a term, which is you know boxes with blinky lights, um, I would argue we're awash in boxes with blinky lights. And most organizations have racks full of last year's boxes with blinky lights that don't bl blink, blink as brightly anymore. They don't twinkle like they used to. I would argue that it's an absence of process and planning um, that is holding us back in many disciplines, right? Um, if you don't tie these things together, if you don't look at cybersecurity as an engineering problem, how do you ever truly articulate the requirements for things, right? That's interesting. And it, it, as you're speaking, it makes me think a little bit about not just the fields of, you know, you said an automobile, but even something like finance. There's been a huge amount of work in the financial field that we're going to protect the consumer against people who are trying to get whatever it is they have. And it's, there's been a lot of work. How do I design a system where even someone who really has no knowledge of finance and they're just trying to use the system to buy groceries won't get scammed? And we've almost put the work on the, on the finance industry much more than on the individual. The individual is protected an awful lot. Is that something that you see? It, I guess I don't know what kind of practices you expect to be seeing coming out of the general IT and security industry to 
move that forward. Yeah, so I'll offer you this, right? There's there's an idea in psychology, the paradox of choice, right? That if I put 10 jars of jam in front of you, and then I put 20 jars of jam in front of you, and the 30 jars of jam, you're actually increasingly less likely to actually select a jar of jam, right? The idea is that by giving people more choices that they don't fundamentally understand the difference between the things you're choosing between, um, you're actually making their decision-making harder. And I feel like some information systems um, are giving people that 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 experience, which is there's many ways to protect yourself. Um, should I hit update now uh, or should I not click on the link or do both, right? Um, it's saying I need to provide my domain password. I don't know what the domain is, but I know what my password is. Should I put it in there? I, I think the more that we can streamline and reduce the complexity of the decision making, the better off we are. That's interesting. And, it's, and that comes down both to those who are designing the software those who are designing the hardware and those who are trying to put the whole thing together for the for someone to actually use it, and that's a, that's a, that's a pretty it's a pretty big challenge I would, I would imagine. Yeah, so I think um, the hottest topic right now um, in in any technical sphere right is artificial intelligence and machine learning. I know a topic you think about a great deal, Ellie. And one of the things that occurs to me is we're we're, we're still struggling with the fundamentals. Um, we're struggling uh, to determine what appropriate user behavior is. I'm just imagining this future where very complex algorithms making decisions by themselves, essentially, right? I mean, programmed by people, obviously. But I, I'm worried that we're going to create very complex systems of systems where the fundamentals still aren't addressed. I wonder if, you know, I know this is a domain you know quite a bit about. Any thoughts about sort of um, how we can have a, a short autonomy or, and I know that's, that's sort of a buzzword, but h- how do we create greater faith in, in AI and ML? I mean, so for right now, the AI and ML field is really still in its infancy. The, there's, the way we try to split it up, there's a huge amount of effort that's been put into designing these really smart algorithms. Though That was actually done decades ago. So we've had the same general algorithms, the same techniques to do these things for a long time. The problem has been we haven't had an effective way to manage the huge amount of data required to actually gain benefit from these algorithms. So to that extent, we're just entering the period now where we're learning how to use these algorithms with the existing data we have. One of the things that we're learning is that in certain areas, things work really well. So, you know, if you go to a modern search engine and you type in the, you know, say bird and click on image, it'll show you tons of pictures of birds because image recognition turns out to be a good problem. But for other areas, it's not quite so clean. So cybersecurity is one area where, you know, you want to say, Find me everyone who's hacking into my network. Find me all un, you know, all un, uh, un, uh, authenticated users who are trying to get in. Or find me someone who's sending me in malware. That turns out to be a much harder problem for a whole variety of reasons. So uh, at this point, I think we're still a bit out from really having that be a turnkey solution. Just pop, pop that new blinking light box in and, and go. So is it fair to say that humans will be in the loop for quite some time? I think uh, I think we're pretty good. <laughs> You're pretty assured with that, right? I mean, no one knows exactly what put point will be, right? But it does seem to me that, um, like like any new technology, there's going to be this this hype cycle, um, and and with AI, it seems like some of the projected benefit is getting ahead of the state of the technology, which is again, uh, I think, a pretty common occurrence. I see this very complicated future again, where um, human beings are still human beings, algorithms are doing things that are new and novel and difficult to understand, and we're doing so much of this at arm's length in the cloud, right? So a third party, it's extraordinary if you look at um, the growth of a third party doing X, Y, and Z for you, right? Um, So this might seem like an overreach potentially in this conversation, but I really think that one of the things we need to reskill folks on is not just AI and ML, but also understanding the nature of third party relationships, right? How do service level agreements function to protect you, right? And I would argue that that should be added to that list of cyber essentials, right? Which is understanding how to have justified confidence in a third party, justified confidence in algorithm, justified confidence in an algorithm operated by a third party, it all comes down to evidence uh, and understanding the things you own, what they do, and what your risk appetite is. And that's interesting. One of the things which we see a lot when we're trying to deploy these AI algorithms is people don't understand what it is they're getting. They don't understand how to assess whether it's performing properly, and they definitely don't understand when the data comes back to them what should they be doing with it? Oftentimes, they think it's like, well, here's the answer. Frequently, it's not giving you a single answer. It's just giving you evidence. And then once you're trying to provide and act on that evidence, it's honestly not so easy to tell what direction you should go as far as a decision. So there's definitely a lot of work to be done there. Um, Matt, thanks a lot for joining. I really appreciate it. Thank you all very much for joining us. My pleasure, Thank you. 
Uh, and uh, for more information on our work, uh, please see the website below or send us an email. Thank you very much. <laughs>